This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, good morning, Rabbi Isai. Welcome, everyone. As we begin a very special series, which will be about at least five parts, we always have around Shavuos time an interesting uh, series. So this series is going to be about the last will and testament of Rabbi Huda HaChasid, the Tzava of Rabbi Huda HaChasid. Uh, Rabbi Huda and his Tzava left uh, a number of very interesting admonitions. Some of them are somewhat questionable, especially because uh, they seem to contradict what it says in Gemaras. Uh, today's Rosh Chodesh, so we'll mention one of the Tzavas of Rabbi Huda HaChasid, and uh, it's even cited in the Mishnah Bura, is not to take a haircut on Rosh Chodesh. Well, the question is, what is this tzava? Is the tzava of a God of Esau really binding on the Jewish people? Is it binding on anybody? Is it Aser? Do we have to listen to it? Does anyone have to listen to it? What is uh, the meaning of this tzava? And uh, in order to really understand uh, the impact of the tzava and the bi- whether it is binding, we have to get uh, the historical background of who Rabbi Huda Chassid was, the times that he lived in, where he comes from, and that will give us a, a better picture to understand Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid. Um, so I think today's presentation will be about the father of Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid. Um, then we'll discuss Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid himself, and then we'll go on to, uh, hopefully tomorrow, discuss some of the things that he, he left in his will and uh, whether, in fact, they are binding or not. So this will be a many-part series. It's a really a sensational topic. And uh, let us begin. So, uh, much of the information we have about Rabbi Yudah Chassid comes from a, a biography, which I don't have, but uh, it's available. It's called Chassidim Harishonim. Now, when we say Chassidim Harishonim, you have to understand that uh, this is well before the Besht, well before the Baal Shem Tov, right? The Baal Shem Tov was in uh, only a few hundred years ago. We're talking now about the 12th century, okay? 500 years before Chassidus. But these were Rishonim who lived in Germany. Now also understand, there was no Kabbalah in terms of the Zayah had not been discovered yet. So in Germany there was mysticism without Kabbalah. It was a different brand of Kabbalah than the Arizal. It was a very ascetic type of uh, movement where you had great people, but we're talking about who, who would fast Always. People who did not have any hana from this world at all. And one of the things that they specialized in is the exact wording of the Siddur. That was one area of their specialty. These are called the Chachme Chasidei Ashkenaz, the Chachamim of Germany. And they were their own brand, so to speak, of Chasidim. We know the Balei Hatoisvus were very much in France. But these were Balei Hatoisvus in Germany, in Spire, in Regensburg. And we're talking now, we're going to go back to the 12th century. Um, let's just begin with a comment. So a lot of this information comes from the Sefer Chassidim HaRishayinim, written by Rabbi Kusiel Aryeh Kamalhar, who was a Rav and a historian at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Ultimately, he was a Rav in Europe, and then he, at the end of his life, I think he came to the Bronx. Um, and as well as the Sefer HaChassidim, the most uh, well-known work of Rabbi Yudah is the Sefer HaChassidim. And there's the edition that was uh, published by Mosad Rav Kook, the Rav Ruven Margolius edition. So Rav Ruven Margolius wrote an extensive commentary on the Sefer HaChassidim. But let's begin with a, a statement that we have a tradition about Rabbi Yudah HaChassid, who we have here was born in the year Dalid, Tav Tav Kuf Yud. That's approximately the year 1150. And he was Nifter and Dala Tav Tav Kuf Ayin Zayin. That's the year 1217. He was born in Speyer in Germany. He was Nifter in Regensburg in Germany on Yud Gimel Adar on Tainus Esther in 1217. We have a tradition about him that if Rabbi Huda Chassid would, be, would have been in the times of the Neviim, he would have been a Navi. If he would have been in the times of the Tanoim, he would have been a Tanaf. If he would have been in the times of the Amram, he'll be an Amara. Such is the tradition that we have about him. He was the son of Rabbeinu Shmuel HaChassid, the grandson of Kleinimus Hazakin from Magensia, um, the son of Rabbeinu Yitzchak, 
son of Rabbi Eliezer Hagadol, the son of Rabbi Yitzchak Hagadol, son of Rabbi Yeshua Hagadol, the son of Rabbi Rabbi Abun Hagadol. Rabbi Abun Hagadol had very mystical traditions about the precise number of words of each tefillah, the significance of that number of words, and a lot of the Kabbalistic uh, meaning of the tefillahs. Okay, so now, one of the other great Chachmei Ashkenaz, who was uh, considered like a student of Rabbi Yudah Chassid, who we quote from very often when we learn about the Siddur, is the Reikeach, Rabbi Lezer of Garmaiza. And in the Chidah's entry to Rabbi Lezer of Garmaiza, he writes, the Siddur and the Sefer the Reikeach, was a sefer that was compiled of tefillahs and their secret. He had a tradition from Rabbeinu Yehuda HaChassid, who had a tradition all the way back from his Rabbeim till Shimon HaPakuli. Shimon HaPakuli, the Gemara in Megillah says, was the one who formulated and one who gave the meaning of the Shemana Esrei. So their tradition of the tefillah goes all the way back to Anshe Knesset Um The father of Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid, was given the appellation. Oh, we'll get to that in a, mem- the, in a moment. The father of Rav Yudah uh, Chazer, Shmuel HaChasid, had a tradition from Rabbeinu Eliezer Chazan. Now we'll see who's Rav Eliezer Chazan. Rav Kloinimus, the father of Shmuel, again, the line is Rav Yudah Chazid, the son of Rav Shmuel HaChasid, the son of Rav Kloinimus. I believe Rav Kloinimus passed away when Rav Shmuel, uh, his son, was very young. And he wasn't old enough to receive the mystical teachings from his father. So his father gave over these mystical teachings to someone by the name of Reb Eliezer Chazan, who then gave it over to Rav Shmuel HaChassid when Rav Shmuel was a, little, a bit older. Be it as it may, the Marami Rotemurg, in a tshuva Kuf Yud Gimel, excuse me, in a tshuva on page Kuf Yud Gimel, says that Rav Shmuel, the father of Yud was given the title Navi. Okay? That's what we're talking about. That he was given the title of Navi, and they had a tradition about the Tfilois Halacha Lamaisha Misinai. But so I want to give you a little picture of what the father of Yehuda Chasid is like. Because when you're going to see the Tzava, you have to understand what this is, where this is coming from. This is coming from people from on a different realm. Living in walking the same planet we walk, but living in a different world. So in the Sefer Chassidim Arishanim, he brings down, like we mentioned, Rav Shmuel, the father of Rabbi Yudah Chassid. And what, what, what we'll conclude this year today with is, there is a famous piyot written by Rav Shmuel HaChassid that we're probably all familiar with. I don't think anybody knows that he wrote it, though. That's what we're going to conclude with today. So anyway, um, Rav Shmuel was born to his father of Kleinimus in the city of Spires around the year Tav Tav Ayin Hay, 11.15. When he was 10 years old, his father of Kleinimus passed away in the year 10.26. And his older brother, Rabbi Yehuda, raised him and learned with him. And then, when Rav Shumal got older, this Rabbi Lazar Chazan of Spires gave over to him the secrets of his father. Because Rav Kleinimus gave over to Rav uh, Eliezer Chazan these soydos that to give over to son when his son gets older. So here we go. How old was his older brother? Do you know? Don't know. I, you know the birth certificate. I don't have anymore. Didn't what? give over to his older brother. Didn't give over. To somebody else. Listen to this. Story goes that Rav Shmuel <coughs> was walking down the street, and all of a sudden. He looked up at the sky and he saw the heaven open. He saw the heaven open. And he told the people who were accompanying him, You see it? You see it? You can ask whatever you want. Everyone, ask for whatever you want. So one of them asked for children, one of them asked for wealth, and Rav Shmuel asked to have children like him. And he had two sons, Rabbi Avram and Rabbi Huda. So, okay, this is what we're talking By the way, and, and it's pointed out that we learned from here, that if you're ever walking down the street and you see the heavens open up, it's always a good opportunity to dive in for whatever you want. So don't miss the opportunity. You always have to uh, be aware of the moment of the opening of the heavens. Okay. Now, besides his Torah and Chachma Nigla, he was one of the 
specialist in the secrets of the Torah. He was known, like we mentioned, as a Kosh and a Navi. He was one of the first to be Mepharsim Kabbalah and what's called Kabbalah Maisias, meaning practical Kabbalah. When I say practical Kabbalah, I mean he can make things. He can do things. Not just learning about the spheroids. He could do things, as we're about to see. Um, so he was Moas in this lowly world, and his mind soared the heavens. Okay, here's another story. Story goes that the Rav Shmuel Achasa was so poor, he didn't even have bread to eat. So one time he told his wife that in the community of spires, there's a terrible looming uh, decree, and therefore they both need to fast for three days. So, and they did. On the eve of the third day, Rav Shmuel said to his wife, Baruch Hashem, the danger has passed. Cook up a chicken. Now, that was like beyond their uh, budget, the chicken. You know, if anybody, they were Meforsim as Anim. You know, it would not have been good if people would have gotten wind that they were eating a chicken. You know, that would have sort of... Uh, so you could create one? That would have given, uh, that would have given up their... Uh, but be it as it may... One of his Tamidim saw, and he couldn't help but ask, but Revi, why are you uh, having a chicken on a regular weekday? I thought, you know, we th- all thought you were poor. So Rav Shmuel says, if I would want to reveal to you what I did, you would mock me, and everyone would mock me, and therefore it's better that I keep quiet. But the Talmud pressured and pressured him, and finally he admitted he fasted for three days, and he abolished the looming decree. Okay? Now again, are these stories, did they happen? It's not, it's not important whether they happened yet. The, Stories give you a picture of the times, of the personality. You know, we're, we're talking about supernatural people. Okay, here he brings that the wonders and the moivsim that Rav Shmuel did became widespread in the world. So legend has it that uh, three galachim came to Rav Shmuel from a faraway land, and uh, these galachim knew how to use shemois of Tumah. Okay? Shemois of Tumah. So they told Rabbi Shmuel, we heard about your wisdom and your godless, how it spread to the whole world. But one thing we have. Um, so, they, so they said to the Galachim, said, show us, you know, show us one of your tricks. And we'll show you one of our tricks, you know. After, after all, these Galachim specialized in Kayach HaToma, and he, had, uh, he knew how to do Moivsim. So they wanted to exchange, uh, exchange techniques. So they said like this. Now, there was a certain Rabbeinu Yaakov who lived at a distance, lived far away from Rabbeinu Shmuel, who had a certain sefer that Rabbeinu Shmuel really wanted to see. So Shmuel said, if you could bring me the sefer for Rabbeinu Yaakov like that, if you could say abracadabra and bring me the sefer, that's, that's pretty chashev. Then I'll, then I'll believe that you got something going. So they said, we'll do even better. We'll do more than that. Come out with us to the field where nobody's around. And we're going to show you the trick of the century. We're going to, we're going to draw a circle. One of us, Galachim, are going to be Mashbia, the other Galach. Remove his neshama. Send the neshama to Rabbeinu Yaakov. And by the way, if you want to send Rabbeinu Yaakov any writings or anything, give it to this guy, because when we remove his neshama, he'll deliver it to Rabbeinu Yaakov, and he'll come back with the Sefer from Rabbeinu Yaakov. And then will you believe us that we've got something, you know, we've got something good going? Same day delivery. Yeah. Before Amazon. <clears throat> it's basically, nowadays they call it a drone, right? But um, they, he said, yeah, let's go for it. So they basically, uh, they swore that the neshama needs to leave the body and will return in three days. And so Rav Neshama followed them into the forest. And on the third day, they're waiting for the soul to return to the body. And Rabbeinu Shmuel is standing there. No, 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 no. Nice try. I will not let the... And he was ma'akev the neshama from returning back into the galach. And all the galachim were crying and screaming, No, how did, what happened? That's impossible. Nobody ever foiled our soul removal r- retrieval trick, you know. And Rabbeinu Shmuel said... On one condition, you have to be minded to me that my power is greater than yours. And finally they admitted, and then the soul of the Galach returned to his body. And from there on, everyone acknowledged that Rabbi Shmuel's power was supreme. Again, he got the book. yeah, yeah, he got the book. He got the book. And he got the book. So, 
So, Marvin Abayi Why did he need the Galachim to get the book? He could have arranged to have it. You know, you don't just use this, this power at will. It has to be a real need. You can't just do it because, you know, you want the latest edition of a, of a book that came out. Again, I wasn't there personally. And it's not a... This, these are the, the Agados that they say over about Rabbi Shmuel. Another one. Rabbi Shmuel was one of the first Hasidim who would uh, do what's called, he would prav golos. Prav golos means to travel from community to community with no money, with no provisions, as a way of uh, expia, a way of um, cleansing oneself from their sins, and to spread Torah, to spread Yerushamayim. And says, uh, it's brought over here, Rabbi Nishma was one of the first people who created a goylam. The Maral probably never created a Gailam. However, Rabbeinu Shmuel in the 12th century did. In fact, the Gailam came with him on all of his travels. I could use one of those, you know. But anyway, the story goes that Rabbeinu Shmuel was on a boat. And he heard a lion in distress. And he goes off the boat and a lioness had attacked the lion. Now, everybody knows... The, the lions don't, the lions are the babysitters. The lionesses are the hunters. You know? Yeah, but, the, but the lion is the boss of the pride. Yeah, it's like at home, where the man is the boss and the woman does everything, you know? <laughs> but anyway, so this lion was in distress. So Rabbi Shmuel saved the lion, and from then on, this lion accompanied Rabbi Shmuel on all of his travels. Now, I know it doesn't say if it was at the same time as the Gailam or at a different time, a, but, but uh, he, had, he had an interesting entourage. Here goes another story, okay? And the story goes like this. There is a toy system in Achas, Lamed Heyam and Beis. Let's see if we can find the Menachas here. And that is, no, there is no Menachas. There is a Taisus in Menachis. Where did Menachis go? Over here. Okay. The story goes like this. We know that there's a mitzvah to be mahadik your tefillin on your head. To put the tefillin on the head. Do you need to tie the tefillin of the head? We don't. But many Rishonim say it's a mitzvah to tie every day the tefillin shalrash. We don't do that. The kasher, tefillin shalrash. It's a machloikas. I mean, if you read the Pasuk, it says, Ukshatam lo'ois al yadecha. The yad you tie. V'hayu l'tai tafois benein benein echam. So it's a machlekes and toysus in Menachos on Daf Lamed Hey Amid Beis between Rabbeinu Tam and Rabbeinu Eliyahu, and Rabbeinu Yaakov, Rabbeinu Tam asked the Navi. Now, which Navi? It's brought in the Sefer Seder Adoros, and they said, "Ask Rabbeinu Eliyahu from Parish." And ask Rabbi Tam how they tie the Kesher Shot Tefillin. Do you have to tie it every day or could you just tighten it? So the Navi came and he summoned Matatron. He said, Matat, Matat, get down here! Matat said, what do you want from me? I can't, I can't come down because Moshe is here and I'm, embarrassed, I'm afraid to leave. Ask whatever you want and I'll respond to you. And, Rav, and the Navi got angry. He said, come down here and bring Rabbi Eliyahu from Paris and Rabbi Tam. He said, no, Rabbi, Rabbi Eliyahu can't come down because he's bringing, meaning bring Eliyahu on Navi. He's bringing Karbanos and Shemayim. Eliyahu is too busy right now. We're not getting him down. In other words, they had a halachic shayla and this Navi, who we're going to see was clearly of Shmuel HaNavi. Again, Shmuel HaNavi, not Shmuel HaNavi in the Navim, Shmuel HaChosid was summoning Eliyahu and the Malach Matad down to ask them a halachic shayla about whether you need to tie the Kesher at Tzvon Shalrosh. He says that Eliyahu can't come using Makrav Karbanos. So Shmuel HaNavi says, 
get down here. I don't care what he's doing. I have a question on halacha. I mean, I'll have to do that later. So he said, no, if, if he comes down, the Shekhinah is going to come. So the Rabbanon decided it's not right to bother Hashem about this. So Rabbeinu Yaakov said, let's just ask Moshe Rabbeinu. That should be good enough. So the Navi asked Moshe Rabbeinu, how do you tie tefillin shel kesha shel tefillin? So Moshe says, you're not doing it right. You don't tie the shel yad, you tie the shel roish. Every day, Moshe Rabbeinu says. And Rabbeinu Tam said, what? Ma, he said, Moshe, you made a mistake. You're wrong, Moshe, Rabbeinu Tam says. You don't have to tie it every day. You only have to be mahadik. Because it says, Ukshatim la'os al yadecha. So Moshe, in his great humility, said, I never said you have to. I just said it's a mitzvah too. It's not ma'akev. So Rabbi Nassim said, how could a mitzvah not be ma'akev? So Moshe says, don't get so worked up, Rabbi Nassim, you're wrong, Moshe said. You have to tie it every day. And the, tf- the kesher has to be in the shel roish, in the dalid. And I'm going to bring you a raya for my Torah that I gave you, Moshe says. And from the pasuk that you quoted me, it says, Ukshatam ois al yodecha. It juxtaposes ois to ukshatam. It says, Ukshatam ois to say that you need to tie that which is an ice. The tone shel yad is not an ice because you don't see it, it's covered. Only the tone shel roish is an ice. Ukshatam la ice, you need to tie the ice, says Moshe Rabbeinu. So Rabbeinu Sam says, but it says the word, uh, that's the shel roish. That means before that we weren't talking about the shel roish. So Moshe says, no, let me explain to you. Ukshar tam la'ais is going on the shel roish, which is the ois. That needs kshira. Ay, it says ayodecha. That just means you know when ukshar tam la'ais? When the tefillin shel yad is ayodecha. That's how you read the Pasuk. Now, this is not my pshat. But says, this is pshat in the Torah that I gave you. So I think I know what I, you know, I, think I, know what I meant. Ukshar tam la'ais. Tie the ois. When? When you're wearing what's ayodecha. Then it should be when it's al yadecha vayulo taytafais beneinecha. And according to you, that the kshir has to be the yad. I never told you to make a yud on the ton shal yad. It doesn't say that anywhere. Where'd you get that from even? I never taught that. The chachomim were masakin to add a yud on the ton shal yad. But it's not what I gave to you. What I gave to you is the dalit of the shal roish. Therefore, they never said to make the Yud on the Shalroish so as you don't make a mistake and think it's an absolute command. And then Eliyahu came to support Moshe Rabbeinu and uh, they were going back and forth and bringing Rayas and Rabbeinu Tam responded or Yaakov Miparansi said to Rabbeinu Shmuel who should rely on and Moshe Rabbeinu said, nowhere in the whole Torah do we find you have to make a Yud. And if you do, you could rely on Rabbeinu Tam B'Shas HaTchak. B'Shas HaTchak, you don't have to tie it. But Mitzvah Min HaMuvchar says Moshe, Rabbeinu Tam is not correct. You have to tie the Shal Rosh. So the next day Shmuel Hanavi asked Moshe Rabbeinu, the Yud of Shakai, why, didn't, why is it not written with the Shin? He said, I'll tell you why. Because when I saw God, I only saw His Tfil and Shal Roish. I didn't see His Tfil and Shal Yad. And I saw Shin and Adalid. And I never saw the Tfil and Shal Yad of Hashem. That's why I didn't tell you to do it. So this is a very interesting story, obviously. <laughs> this is a conversation that Shmuel, the father of Rabbi Yudah Chassid, is having with Moshe Rabbeinu. And apparently... Rabbeinu Tam also was in on this conversation. Rabbeinu Tam argued on Moshe Rabbeinu. So a very interesting machloik is between Rabbeinu Tam and Moshe Rabbeinu. Rabbeinu Tam says you don't have to tie the tefillin shel roish. Moshe Rabbeinu says you should. That's a, but here's the, here's the interesting question, right? When did Rabbeinu Tam from France ever meet Shmuel Hanavi from Germany? When did they ever get together? So here we have it. Actually, look at number seven. Actually, one time, there's a story with Rabbeinu Yaakov Miruma, which means Miromara, that's Rabbeinu Tam. He always wanted to meet Shmuel HaChassid. One time, Shmuel HaChassid, remember we said he was on one of his uh, 
trips, and uh, he he was there for seven years, some say nine years, and he came to Rabino Tam's house, and Rabino Tam asked him. Uh, he asked about Rabino Tam, and he went to Rabino Tam's house, and he didn't say one word. Shmuel did not open his mouth. And one time Rabino Tam said, "What's your name?" He said, "My name is Shmuel Fratzminer." Now there was some low life in those times who had the name Shmuel Fratzminer. So after Rabino Tam heard his name was Shmuel Fratzminer, he didn't have any more conversations with him. He sort of just waited for him to leave. After he left, one of the Tamir Rabbi Tam said, Moiri Varebi, I think yesterday when you asked this guest who he was, and he said uh, his name is Shmuel Fratzmuner, I think that was Shmuel Hanavi. I think that was Shmuel Hanavi. Rabbi Tam said, Really? So why didn't he say a word? He said, I think uh, out of humility he didn't say anything. So Rabbi Tam said, Let me see myself. And he wrote after him, and he, and he wanted to see if in fact this was Shmuel Hanavi. And Rabbi Tam said, if, he's, if you're lying to me, I'm going to put you in Kherim. Wouldn't, wouldn't he have seen the lion and the girl? He was traveling with the lion and the girl. You mean, yeah, apparently they booked in the Holiday Inn that night, you know? <laughs> so. Stay behind Shnei Naro and, and go with him. <laughs> so, Rabbi Tam uh, rode after him with some of his Tamidim. And when he caught up with him, he said, Rabbi Yang said, um, Are you. Uh, are you Rav Shul? He said, yeah. So, but, you know, on Shul Dikmir, I didn't respect you properly. Um, I know you're Rav Shmuel HaChassid. And Rabbi Tam pressured him, and he came back with him, and he spent two weeks with him. And after, um, after they spent some time, they had Yechidus together in a room, and they did what they did. Okay, which, you know, we can't get more explicit... Yeah, um, and brought over here very likely that whatever went on between Shmuel Hanavi and Rabbeinu Tam and Moshe Rabbeinu probably happened during those two weeks. So Rabbi said, take a look at number eight. It's uh, brought over here in the tour. The tour brings down Darshe Rishumais, the those who expounded, those who expounded on the Drashais, Him Chasidei Ashkenaz. The tour says. Are the sages of Ashkenaz, Asher Hayu Shoiklim Vesoifra, Misra Minyan Tevais, Hatfilis, Abrachas, they would weigh and count the number of words of the Torah, uh, of the Tfilis and the Brachas, and connect what they're, they're corresponding to. So the, if you want to know which Chachamim specialized in the number of words of the Tfilah and the meaning of the Tfilah, these were the Chasidei Ashkenaz. And who are the Chasidei Ashkenaz? Says the Sefer Chasidim Rishon number 9. There's no question this refers to Rav Shmuel HaChassid, Rav Yehuda HaChassid, and their Talmud, Rav Elazim Yigar Maiza, that we see from their Svarim how they count every word of Tefillah, and this was something that they specialized in. Moirav Raboisai, is there any remnant of the writings of Shmuel HaNavi? Is there anything that we have from him? Yes, indeed. One of the most mystical songs that Kal Yisrael has is something that we sing the night of Yom Kippur after the Tefillah. Shir HaYichud. The Shir HaYichud was written by Rav Shmuel HaChassid, the father of Rabbi Yudah HaChassid. And in there are all kinds of mysticism and uh, mystical ideas and all kinds of Kabbalah. So here, if someone who does not recognize the Gvur of Shmuel HaChassid, just look at the Shir HaYichud. And this work testifies about the one who composed it. Um, you'll see in the Shir HaYichud that this was written by a Baruch HaKodesh almost on the level of Nevuah. By the way, the Choyza Melublin, yeah? Rabbi Yaakov Yitzchak said, there's a story that there was a famine and the earth was so dry that the animals were dropping dead. And people came to the Choyza to spout to Davin Tashem for the rain. And all he did is, right now, the only school we could do, we have to talk about the godless of the Mechaber, the Shir HaYichud. And he described the greatness of the Baal Shir HaYichud. All of a sudden, the heavens clustered with thick clouds, and it rained, and it poured, and until they couldn't even leave the base Medrash. Then uh, the Choyza said, 
that at a time that a person cannot sort of wrap his mind around all the proper Yehudim, the Shira Yehud is Koilal all the Yehudim. Okay, so that is the father. So now you know what Rabbi Huda Chassid is born into. You know, he's not born into the average uh, American home. He's not born, he, he didn't grow up on uh, frosted flakes and uh, fruity pebbles. He grew up in a house of extreme Kedusha, uh, mysticism, Kabbalah. Yeah, I, you know, there's a whole sefer written about the family. I just took out some of the highlights over here. But let's just start Rabbi Yudha Chos, and then so, um, just to complete today's uh, uh, subject. So here he brings, this is already Chelek Bez of the Sefer Chassidim Rishonim, that one of the great luminaries that shines 700 years ago for many, many centuries, uh, a luminant light, a brilliant light, is uh, Rabbeinu Yehuda Chassid, who was born in Spires, and we don't know exactly, but approximately, we said in the year 1150 or so. Um, let's just say one story. Uh, one, the one story we mentioned already, how his father uh, was walking down the street and the heavens opened up. And again, that shows that where his birth came from, where his creation came from, from this magical story. But there's one other Misa, which is interesting, and that is... The wife of Rabbi Shmuel, when she was pregnant with Rabbi Yudah Chassid, was going in shul in worms, and a wagon was coming by and pushed her against the wall, right, you know, the, the narrow alleyways. And, you know, basically, you know, there's a truck coming down the road of full steam, and uh, legend has it that... Like that um, a miracle happened, and the wall bent backward, in a way that the mother of Yudah Chassid was able to be saved. Uh, I think I hear a bas call, right? That, uh, that, that the mother was saved. That's a similar story that we have to Rashi. So this gives us a little backdrop into the world that Rabbi Yudah Chassid was born into. Bezos Hashem, tomorrow in the first segment, we'll learn about who Rabbi Yudah Chassid was, and we hope to start about the tzava of Rabbi Yudah HaChassid. On that note... Wish everyone a good and You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.